Okay. Um, all right. We're going to go ahead and get started. So, um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining us for uh, this uh, December uh, webinar in the Climate Change AI webinar series. Um, today, we're going to discuss the role of uh, big tech companies versus open source in uh, climate science research um, in the space of uh, using machine learning and data science to, to address climate science research related goals. Um, we're going to hear from three uh, very cool speakers working on these aspects, um, and the webinar will be co-moderated by myself and um, Kai, uh, who, will, who will speak in just a moment. Um, but before diving into the discussion, we'd love to just quickly introduce uh, the work we do at, at Climate Change AI, which is the organization hosting this webinar. Um, so Climate Change AI is a nonprofit initiative to catalyze impactful work at the intersection of climate change and machine learning by bringing together a global community of stakeholders working in both machine learning and climate change related areas. So that's you all who are on the webinar. Thanks for joining. Um, and then trying to guide these collaborations and guide the doing of impactful work in this area by providing educational resources and programs, funding tools and data sets, and also working with um, policymakers, funders, other entities in this space to try to advance discourse and figure out how we can best set up this work to succeed. Uh, next slide. Um, and so if you're um, in this webinar and interested in engaging in some of climate change as activities, there are a couple of ways you can get started. So one of them is by learning more about this space. What exactly do we mean by the intersection of climate change and AI? And we'll, while we'll cover kind of one slice of that during today's webinar, there are a variety of ways that AI plays a role across not just climate science, but electricity systems, buildings, agriculture, heavy industry, and so forth. And so we have various digital resources on our website, including a foundational report on climate change and AI, um, summaries, tutorials, and a wiki. We also hold various conferences and events, um, including a workshop series at the major machine learning conferences where you can submit work or learn about work that others are doing. And also if it's your first time kind of preparing a, a, a research style publication for a workshop like this, you can also join into our mentorship programs to be paired with somebody um, working on a comp with a complementary skill set to you in order to, to do this. And so uh, not yet formally announced, but our next workshop will be at iClear 2023 in Kigali, uh, Rwanda. And we also have a summer school for which applications are currently open, where you can kind of learn more about the space of AI and climate change and also work on collaborative projects. So applications are now live. And so feel free to check that out if you're interested. We also run various funding programs. Uh, so we recently announced the launch of our second innovation grants program, which again, funds research at this intersection of climate change and AI. And we have a little a bit upwards of $1 million worth of funds available this year. So if you're interested in applying for that, please check out the website. Uh, and then there are lots of other ways to get involved on a more continuous basis. So we have an online community platform where you can post questions, find collaborators, a directory you can sign up for, a monthly newsletter that aggregates information about jobs, publications, interesting news developments, and, and things like that in this space, uh, and also a, a blog. We also host webinars like this one, as well as uh, bi-weekly uh, virtual happy hours, as well as reading groups and other meetups. Um, and we also participate in the policy space. So for those who are interested in thinking about how should topics around climate change and AI play out in the public policy arena, um, you, some pointers include our, our report for the Global Partnership on AI, which is on our website, which basically talks about how AI and digitalization policymakers should approach climate change topics. And there are also links to some of our events at the UN Climate Change Conference, including this most recent one at COP27. Um, so yeah, basically big takeaway here is if you're interested in this space, we'd love for you to join the community, meet others working in this area, and really use this webinar not as a kind of ending point for your journey in this space, but really the starting point to continue doing very, uh, hopefully impactful work in this area. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Kai to introduce uh, the topic of today's webinar in a bit more depth as well as our speakers. Yeah, thanks Priya. And thanks for everyone being here. Welcome from my side as well. I will give a quick intro into today's topic and also introduce our speakers. So in recent years, we've seen increasing efforts from various big tech companies in the field of climate research or doing climate research using machine learning and data science, for example, providing infrastructure for geospatial and climate science research 
There we have, for example, the Microsoft Planetary Computer or Google Earth Engine. Also doing climate science themselves, like um, creating digital twins, NVIDIA Earth 2 and forecast net projects are a few to name here. On the other hand, we also have successful open source projects like the Pangeo platform, to which facilitates big data geoscience. And of course, we also have academia and an increasing number of start startups who act in the field. So today we want to discuss the, these recent developments and the roles, perspectives, and also motivations of the various players in the fields, and also to have a look into the future um, to see um, the perspectives of our speakers today. So for this, we have uh, our three wonderful speakers today. We have Dr. Alberto Arribas, who is the Europe Lead Sustainability Science at Microsoft Research. And prior to joining Microsoft, he led the informatics lab at the Met Office. We have Dr. Karthik Kashinath, who is a principal scientist at NVIDIA Research. And previously, he was a scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And we have Dr. Ryan Abernathy, who is co-founder and active contributor to the Pangeo project, and also an associate professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Science at Columbia University. As well, he recently co-founded Earth Mover, which is a startup for climate data science. So I'm quickly going to present the structure of uh, today's webinar. Uh, first, I want to thank again, of course, our speakers that made the time to be here with us today and share their thoughts. Um, so the structure is going to be like this. So we first have three rapid talks from our uh, three panelists um, to just everyone get an overview of uh, what they are doing. Then we will have roughly 25 minutes of uh, panel discussion moderated by Priya and me. And then in the end, we want to open it up for a discussion with the whole audience. So please feel free to uh, write questions in the chat. You can also you can already do that during the discussion. And Priya and I are going to collect the questions in the end and ask them to the panelists. All right. Then I would say, without further ado, Alberto, you could share your screen and start your presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And let me let me see if I click the right the right button. I, I should say that by contractual obligations, I always use Teams. So I always find it interesting having to go to Zoom and I'm just finding whether I'm just clicking in the right place or or not. But yeah, it's a real pleasure to be to be here and thank you very much for, for having me here. And I, I I have been a, a very good kind of a student here and I stick to the to the brief, which was to have only three slides to tell the story in, in five minutes. So what I'm going to do is to tell you a little bit of, in terms of the framing of, of what Microsoft is doing with, with sustainability and the commitments that we have, and then go into explaining how this map actually in terms, in terms of some of the research work that we are, we are focusing on. So in, in Microsoft, we, we have essentially four commitments in sustainability, and, and these commitments are by 2030 to be carbon negative, water positive, zero waste, and in terms of ecosystem, to protect more land than we, than we use. But perhaps the most kind of eye-catching and the one that most directly relate to climate is, is this commitment that is described in this, in this slide here, which is to become carbon negative by, by 2030. And the bottom of the slides kind of mentions how, how we are going to, to essentially achieve this. And, and essentially it has two parts, one which is by reducing emissions and the other one that is by removing emissions. And in terms of the reduction, it starts with the kind of the direct emissions and essentially we are kind of making them uh, pretty much zero by 2025 by essentially moving to energy sources that come from carbon free kind of uh, energy like like renewables etc but of course reducing our direct emissions is only part of the story and the largest fraction of our emissions come from the value chain and that's almost kind of 97 percent and here is where we go into working with people and, and this theme of working with people is very important and i will i will talk a little bit more about it in a in a second but the aim here is to reduce our emissions for the value chain by half and the ones that we cannot reduce to remove. And this is another topic that they wanted to, to highlight, the whole issue of removing emissions, which is something that we have already been doing. So in the last couple of years, we have contracted around kind of projects to remove around two and a half million tons of CO2. 
And, and this is just a start because by 2050, we have committed to remove all of the emissions that Microsoft has, has emitted since the company was founded in, in 1975. So there are many aspects to these commitments and that includes a lot of work from people in operations and management and procurement and, and a great shout to them because there is a lot of incredible work that is happening. But I wanted to, to focus on the, the side of, of research and, and what we are doing there. And particularly, I wanted to highlight an initiative that we have recently launched in, in summer, which is the, the Microsoft Climate Research Initiative. And in this initiative, what we have done is essentially to go out and work with partners. And, and this is a recognition that we don't have all of the expertise that matters in this topic inside Microsoft. So quite a lot of the expertise in climate and environment is going to be outside. And, and here, some of the key partners are, are mentioned from Berkeley, the University of Reading, the University of Michigan, the University of Valencia. And, and it's really important to work with these people because what we are trying to do here is to bring together the areas where we have kind of deep expertise, like computational tools and computational science, with the areas in climate that others are going to bring a kind of an expertise. But we want to do it in a way that focuses on particular problems. And this is what I'm showing in this kind of third slide here. And, and there are three areas where we are focusing our efforts here. And the, the decision for these three areas is because we believe these are the areas where computational tools and the knowledge that we have at Microsoft can have the biggest impact working with others. So the first one is on carbon accounting. And the, the issue or the bottleneck here is that we need measurements that are at the same time kind of relevant at a local level, because we need to know where the emissions are coming from at a local level, but they are also interoperable at a global scale. So we can really kind of account for them and, and make them kind of match all of the emissions from different countries and, and different locations. And this is particularly important for emissions from land use because that's where the uncertainties are bigger. And, and this has big implications for the use of nature-based solutions for removal that I was mentioning before, because that's where most of the options for carbon removal are at the, are at the moment. And from a research point of view, the focus here, we are poking it in, putting it in data fusion so we can improve this measuring and this reduction of uncertainties in, in land use emissions. The second priority in which we are focusing is in decarbonizing the economy. And particularly the bottleneck that we have identified here is materials, because we need new materials that can help us to enable reductions. So for example, by improving kind of the long-term energy storage and also removals. By, by improving the, the development of materials that can capture CO2 directly from, from the atmosphere. And here, the, the research focus that we are putting is in materials engineering, how we can use machine learning to accelerate the discovery of these materials and, and create materials that have the, the right properties. And the final priority that we are focusing on is in the assessment of climate risk. Because this is, 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 we are in a situation in which it's not enough just to kind of think or assess the risk of whether a factory, for example, is going to get flooded or not. So we need to understand what are the climate risks with regards to legislation and the impact that it has in customers and suppliers and, and so on. So the focus that we are putting in the research here is to use causal inference to understand the impact of particular interventions and their unavoidable uncertainties, because we have uncertainties that, that are never going to be reduced to, to zero completely. And one of the examples where we are doing this is in a project for humanitarian aid with the universities of Reading and Valencia and the Microsoft Africa Research Institute to really evaluate how and understand how particular interventions could, could improve uh, humanitarian aid. So this is a quick summary of some of the work that is happening at, at Microsoft related to climate research, but yeah, very much looking forward to the rest of the conversation. And I, I will pass the baton now to, to Karhik. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alberto. All right. Do you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Great, thank you. Yeah, thanks very much for this kind invitation and uh, yeah, very exciting topic. I think a lot of a lot of industries are now getting deeply involved in climate research, and it's an exciting time to bring together this diverse expertise across academia, government, and industries. And uh, I'm Karthik, a principal engineer and scientist in AI and HPC at NVIDIA, um, and deeply involved in Earth2, which is aiming to build digital twins for weather and climate. 
So I'm going to begin with sort of two grand challenges in climate science. I'm just coming out of the AGU conference, and it's amazing to see the wide range of grand challenges that exist in our field. Uh, this is an image adapted from a nature climate change paper by Tapia Schneider, Chris Bretherton, and several others. And it, it sort of shows how computing and uh, numerical modeling of climate change has grown over the last several decades and looking forward towards uh, the next few, next few decades. On the y-axis is resolution of these climate models, on the x-axis is time. And today we're at about 25 kilometer resolution in, in global uh, modeling for, say, for example, the CMIP-6 and the high-risk MIP data sets. Uh, looking towards storm resolving models at kilometer scale, uh, if we take today's comp computations as a baseline, that requires something like 30,000 times more compute uh, to do global cloud resolving models uh, or storm resolving models. But eventually we wanna be at at least 100 meters or finer resolution to, to resolve the low clouds that we know are responsible for the largest uncertainties in climate projections. And that's 500 million times more compute. And the only way we can get there with traditional computing and traditional numerical solvers would be in 2060. And that's probably way too late for us to, to wait. So that's the first grand challenge. The second, and this is uh, from our advisor uh, to Earth2, Professor uh, Bjorn Stevens, and he describes this very eloquently in his SC20 keynote. Even if you can generate these extremely high resolution climate predictions at kilometer or sub kilometer scale, uh, it's very difficult to extract information content from those uh, data sets, let alone interact with it. And so he talks about interactivity as the grand challenge that the climate community faces today. And any one of these kilometer scale trajectories for a 300 year simulation produces something like an exabyte of data. So a thousand petabytes of data, which is impossible to interact with today. So we really need systems that can help us interact with climate data in useful ways. So that brings us to the two main missions of Earth2. And the first mission is interacting with climate predictions at low latency. And this is very much addressing uh, Bjorn Stevens's interactivity challenge. The second is achieving next generation climate predictions at high resolution using a combination of physics, machine learning, and HPC. And these two together are of course tightly coupled and, and that's really where Earth2 is focusing right now. Uh, so why NVIDIA? NVIDIA is a full stack company. Um, a, lot, a lot of people think of NVIDIA as hardware and gaming, but actually NVIDIA does everything from the hardware all the way to the applications at the top of the stack. And this is just a snapshot of some of the things that NVIDIA brings to the table that are very relevant to these grand challenges that, that I just talked about. The first is Omniverse, which allows us to have uh, a smooth, seamless interface that we can collaborate with to, to share data, to share models, to build models together, uh, to interact with the data in many different ways, ask these what if questions and get answers. At the core is what's called Nucleus, uh, which allows the interoperability between different data sets and models, numerical, machine learning, et cetera. Uh, the third on the right is a framework called Modulus that we're developing, uh, has been around actually for a couple of years now, which is a physics-informed machine learning framework to build various types of physics-informed machine learning models. On the bottom left is sort of our newest uh, development, which is very new, but very exciting, uh, which is an end-to-end -end MLOps pipeline. And I'll hopefully get to this a little more in the discussion. Uh, we see a, a huge need for uh, rapid, iterative, reproducible end-to-end -end training of machine learning models, everything from ingestion to pre-processing to training to inference to deployment and doing that hundreds or thousands of times. And, and the automation there is key to achieving a high throughput. And then the bottom uh, in, in the middle and the right are of course the hardware that enables all of this, the accelerated computing with the Grace Hopper super chip and, and super pods. Uh, I want to mention that uh, maybe there's a little bit of a, a debate about uh, open source versus industry. And I want to make clear that uh, Earth2 is very much in collaboration with international climate science. Uh, ForecastNet, for example, is fully open sourced. Uh, we are working with several partners on the right, for example, is a little snapshot of many of the, the agencies, the universities, the uh, institutions, initiatives that we're working with closely on developing, uh, not just ForecastNet, but many other machine learning models as well. 
and and it's meant to be a highly collaborative effort with a lot of our work being open sourced. So um, yeah, I think with that, I'll I'll pause and and pass it on to Ryan. Thank you. Great, thanks, Karthik. You're still muted, Ryan. Here we go. Thanks. Okay, great. So we already introduced a lot of um, uh, of the concepts here, so I can jump into the content. Um, I, I I also took the three slide limit um, pretty uh, seriously, but I I packed a lot <laughs> into these slides, so apologies for that. So. You know, let me start by just talking about, you know, there are obviously many different applications of AI to, to climate change. And, you know, within this, this you know, climate change AI group, there's, there's a vast amount of diversity there. I'm really focused on a fairly specific grand challenge, which is to use data to improve climate models. And uh, this is being pursued. I'm, I'm involved in three, you know, sort of large efforts around, around this. this is my own lab, the Ocean Transport Group at Columbia. Then I'm a, a member of the multi-scale uh, machine learning for Earth System modeling project led out of NYU and the LEAP project, uh, uh, learning the Earth with artificial intelligence and physics based out of Columbia. And I'm using this great figure that was made by Laura Zana, the PI of M squared lines to just try and get across like, what is this research that we're trying to do? Well, first, it's important to recognize that climate models are really our central source of information about what the planet will look like in the future. And so anything, any improvements we can get to them is really going to have major benefits for long-term adaptation and mitigation strategy. Um, climate models are, for the most part, based on physics and traditional numerical methods for simulation. And they don't generally leverage the vast amounts of data that are potentially available to constrain um, uncertainties, model errors, and in particular, resolve all of those fine scale processes that Kartik alluded to that are happening below the grid scale. So a theme in a lot of this research is trying to leverage uh, observations and very high resolution direct simulations to build physics aware and interpretable uh, machine learning models, subgrid models that are embedded within the broader climate modeling uh, hierarchy that can improve structural errors and subgrid errors uh, that will lead eventually to more skillful climate predictions. This is a really um, exciting, important application of AI um, and a lot of people around the world are excited about it. Now, one thing we've learned so far is just how technically demanding and difficult this is at an infrastructural level, right? It involves petabytes of data for these legacy climate models with millions of lines of Fortran code, cutting edge AI methodologies. And it mostly is, has to be executed by PhD students and postdocs, right? Now, so being successful here is requires a lot more than just clever ideas. It really requires deep engineering and infrastructure. And these are areas where academia traditionally has not excelled. We do not prioritize engineering, software and data engineering and infrastructure. We don't incentivize those things. We've already seen that many of the big AI breakthroughs with large language models have happened in big tech, not necessarily academia. Precisely, I think, or for at least part, because they really prioritize infrastructure and engineering that are required to do that type of work. Um, so, you know, for me, my personal mission here has been to improve the, the data side, make it more accessible and make it easier to work with large data sets in the service of climate science and AI um, applied to climate science. And the main vehicle through which I pursued that is this project called Pengeo. I really think Pangeo is best described as a process rather than any specific thing. Pangeo is a community that has enabled this interaction between scientific users and use cases like the one I just described, open source software community, and then the infrastructure community. And all these things need to come together. And we've created a feedback loop through which actual scientific use cases drive improvements in open source software libraries. And then all of these tools can be, we have recipes to deploy this infrastructure, the, the, these tools in various infrastructures. So it can be in HPC systems, it can be in, um, in, uh, in, um, you know, in the cloud, that's very big. 
And, you know, we're, we've sort of aligned on a, a generic infrastructure with this sort of data intensive science, interactive data intensive science that I kind of tried to diagram below. And this project has been pretty successful. I'm, I'm very proud of what's been accomplished. You know, there's a lot of grassroots support and broad adoption for this because these tools sort of solve real problems. Um, far from being a open source, you know, versus industry situation, it's very much been a collaborative one where the same software uh, is used across academia, industry, and national labs. Um, and so we've been very happy to partner, you know, we've partnered with Microsoft heavily, with NVIDIA, with Google, um, and many other smaller companies um, that are all contributing to this open source software stack. Some of the big challenges that I think Pangeo structurally faces is that, you know, there is actually no single Pangeo platform. There's a, dozens of different ways you can put these tools together and deploy them. Um, and those are all sort of their own little silos. And so we're, we're not quite at the point where we have some universal sort of platform or environment where everyone can collaborate. And there's also still a lot of engineering work involved to really get this stuff operating at scale. And so we, we don't, it, there's not just sort of a push button solution here. Um, and so I'll just kind of conclude with saying, you know, where do we need to go? I think to truly democratize this type of data intensive research, we have to go beyond just building software and we have to build services and deliver software as a service. Um, we can do that by embracing the sort of commercial model for software as a service. And so that's what we're trying to do with our company Earthmover that we just started. We can also develop community operated software as a service. Uh, for that, we can get, take inspiration from Wikipedia, Conda Forge, Binder, all of these great sort of non-commercial yet highly effective platforms for online collaboration. And we probably need a mix of both to really, um, you know, make this type of research accessible. And I'll stop there because I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> okay, thanks to all the speakers for the great presentations. There was a lot um, to digest for us all. And uh, yeah, I, I found it also quite interesting to see the different stances and projects that you are involved in. Now we're going to get a nice view of your Christmas tree, Ryan, in the background. <laughs> um, yeah, so I would say we start the, the, the panel discussion. And uh, we already heard it in your, your talks, like that there's like these grand challenges. Um, but maybe you could uh, go again at the point or kind of distill what you think are like really the biggest hurdles that we have at the moment and maybe also how we can overcome them and how you see kind of this whole ecosystem with academia open source big tech like in the next few years where you may you see it evolve to and yeah just feel free to chime in any of you i think it would be nice to get like a discussion going and not just like question answers so yeah, just I'm yeah, happy, happy to start and, and, and actually just reiterate two of the points that were coming out in the presentation so so one is about the climate model themselves, just being the, the workhorse, if you want, of, of the whole area of climate research and understanding what is happening in, in the planet. And at this point, that so we know that the, there are particular biases and processes that need to be improved in the, in the climate models. But actually, to achieve that, we need to improve. We need to increase the resolution. We need to increase the complexity. We need to be able to run more simulations. And that has a computational cost. So that becomes a limitation. And that's one of the reasons that is very attractive, actually, to look at this combination of, let's say, traditional approaches of solving PDEs and HPC with kind of machine learning. And, and how do you start mixing all of these in the different elements? Because this is not a kind of a, a big bang that you are just going to replace one entirely with the other. So this is there are many elements that happen here when you do a a weather prediction or a climate simulation and you need to be able to kind of integrate the, the different approaches in each one of the steps and the other point is about the whole use of the of the data and and how do you kind of enable an ecosystem in which the big tech and the open software is going to come together and i I, I'm completely in agreement with Ryan and Karhik that this is essentially a collaboration. So this is an ecosystem in which different parts come together and you use them in different ways. So for example, the planetary computer at Microsoft is, is built on, on Pangeo software, which is all open software and the planetary computer itself essentially is kind of a 
open architecture and, and open software. And that's very useful because there are going to be people that is going to want to take it and implement it in a particular set of infrastructure to do particular things. And there are going to be people that want to consume it as a service. And they actually are very happy to pay for somebody else to maintain that infrastructure and be able to pick up a phone 24 seven and actually guarantee that they are running and deal with things like authentication and security and so on. So we need that full ecosystem of solutions here. And I think that's very important actually to emphasize that in many ways, the, the critical kind of work that we have to do is to make sure that the lines between the boxes work well and that this can be federated, that you can really play in different systems in a way that is kind of open and, and easy. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll respond if, if that's okay. Yeah, like um, I think a big challenge we see is around data. There are, you know, the, the data volumes involved in this type of research are really vast. And I think we really need to think hard about what is the right framework to share and collaborate on that data? Because no one really wants to be the one who has to pay for hosting the many petabytes of, of climate data. Um, but someone does, and we should really seek to find those partnerships where we can um, not make a lot of copies of these really large data sets, at least. Um, we've really, in Pangeo, we've partnered with the public cloud providers, uh, AWS, Google Cloud, and more recently with Microsoft on bringing data you know, into the cloud in an analysis ready format. And I think that goes really far. Um, on the other hand, that is currently somewhat separated or walled off from the sort of HPC centers where a lot of climate modeling is, is really happening. Um, you know, I'm talking about NCAR and the DOE computing centers and, um, you know, and so I'm really interested in how, how can we create more interoperability and have more shared data between those different sort of computing facilities. Yeah, if I can jump in with, with one more that complements what's already been said. Uh, yeah, I think I'm, I'm starting to see that with, with machine learning really penetrating um, climate research, there's, there's a huge need to be able to train these models over and over again with many different versions, many different architectures, uh, reproduce results, uh, iterate on them, because as we know, machine learning requires a lot of hyperparameter tuning, et cetera. So uh, yeah, to sort of amplify what Ryan shared earlier about the, the engineering that goes behind all of that is huge. And, and that expertise predominantly lives in the industry. Uh, people have been doing it for you know self-driving cars, for all kinds of other applications of machine learning. And it's something that we really need to accelerate uh, for, for making progress with machine learning and climate sciences to be able to have all of that engineering in place. Uh, so the, the climate scientists don't have to, you know, have to learn all of that stuff themselves because it, it, is, it is a complex field. Uh, so I think the ML ops is something that I'm really excited about and, and it very much dovetails into the data access issue. So having you know, ML ops pipelines that you can bring to the data as against moving the data, you know, petabytes of data to where you want to do your machine learning training. That, that's a big challenge as well. Awesome, thanks for sharing. So yeah, in these challenges you all highlighted, right? So data, infrastructure, ML ops, and also coordination between different entities. Um, thinking about that coordination piece, what strikes me is that all of you have worked in sort of at least two different kinds of entities spanning kind of academia, open uh, sort of open source initiatives, government labs, uh, industry. Um, I'm missing one, but regardless, you kind of worked across these different kinds of entities. And I would love to hear, given those perspectives, you know, where do you see the role of big tech versus academic efforts versus the labs versus open source efforts, where do you really see these different initiatives shine? And then as, as Alberto said, like, where do you see the need, like, in what ways do you think it makes sense to draw the, the sort of lines and connective tissue between these? So what is the role of each of these kinds of entities and how do you best coordinate them? 
I'm happy, I'm happy to start, but I, I'm, I'm really interested to hear the perspectives of, of everybody because it's, it's always kind of a very personal experience to jump from one domain to, to another. And one, one thing that I would say is that it doesn't happen enough, actually, the, having this transition of people from one domain, let's say from academia or government labs and, and big tech. So there is not enough movement of people. And I think that's problematic, actually, because the way and the cultures and, and kind of the, the strengths in each one of the places is, is different. So actually having more people that have experience across these boundaries becomes very important because it facilitates the conversation and it facilitates that things can happen. It facilitates that you can create those connecting lines. But then you have to start just kind of building on the strength of each place. And, and there are certain things that happen better in certain places. So it has been mentioned, so in big tech, so for example, now working in Microsoft, we have a lot of infrastructure. We have a lot of people that have been kind of creating and building and maintaining that infrastructure for a long time. And that is a huge strength. If you look at academia, you have a lot of people that are essentially having the, the creativity and the freedom to pursue particular kind of research questions and to really go deep into increasing the understanding and the knowledge there. And that's, that's, that's very important because we need that knowledge. You need to remember that we are doing this to increase our knowledge. It's not just simply to create data. And then you have areas like kind of the government labs that provide that structure that means that you can issue a weather forecast every day and reliably and you maintain all of the observations that need to be done and, and so on. But now we have hit this, this problem that is that the, the kind of the traditional way that we have been improving all of the system and the models and the observations and so on, we, we are really hitting a barrier. So we, we cannot just rely on... on essentially waiting a couple of years and the processor will be much faster. So you have scalability problems, you have new technologies, you have to deal with GPUs and that forces the conversation. So for, for me, the conversation has to be, first of all, accepting that now is going to be a partnership between all of these entities. So it's no longer going to be the case that one is going to do it and the other is going to consume it. And second, how do you accelerate kind of the knowledge and, and the capacity in all of the places to understand each other and, and build on those strengths and not kind of try to use or, or pick up some of the weaknesses because as, as it was mentioned before if you ask a phd student to have to learn how to be a kind of a cloud architect and a data engineer and solve a very difficult research question i mean literally that are really superhuman most of us are just normal human beings so we have to create the structures that enable us to have superhuman teams but not superhuman individuals Yeah, I'd I'd love to, I'd love to respond to that. Like, I think that um, the question of the team structure is one I think about a lot, and I I I often think about like what is the what does a team look like inside you know Nvidia or, or or Google or Microsoft where they're doing climate research, and clearly it's going to have a very different balance of of engineers to scientists, right? And in in academia, we I guess I'm just going to be a little bit more cynical or polemical right and identify i think there's some real problems we have on the academic side we we don't have teams that look like those those teams where you have you know top engineers uh and people working throughout the stack collaborating together with with top scientists um and that's a real problem um because uh for some of this research that we're talking about that might be the only way to to do it um you might need teams that look like that we we i mean beyond just simply the pay scale we just don't offer those type of careers in academia for people who want to work on hard engineering problems maybe at the expense of you know writing fewer papers or something like that right and so that's a it's a big problem and if we can't solve it i think we're going to see the trend accelerate that we already see in climate science which is to some degree, there's a, a little bit of a brain drain I see happening from uh, you know universities and labs to private industry. And this is kind of new for us in climate science. You know, 10 years ago, industry didn't care at all about climate modeling. So we don't, we're not really prepared, I think, culturally for this idea in uh, the way, say, biotech may be, right? We don't have a good model of how we're gonna retain that type of talent and when I see you know companies like Nvidia, for example, moving very aggressively there, I mean I think it's very exciting on the science side, 
And I also look around and I feel a little concerned and I ask myself, how are we going to keep up? Um, and we need to keep up because we know that basic research does need to happen at universities. And um, I think this affects the whole field of AI because it's all very um, engineering intensive and but climate and weather has its own flavor of this problem. Yeah, if, if I could add one more point that complements what's already been shared. Um, yeah, what, one, one thing that I see really exciting, but also hugely challenging is this time scale gap between academia and industry. Uh, things just move on a different time scale, but there is a real need to be able to work together, despite the fact that we might have different time scales in mind. And, and just to clarify what I mean by that is, you know, things are just a lot more fast paced in the industry in terms of wanting to get things out and, and build products and, you know, get results, have applications. But fundamental research cannot be forced to go through that sort of time scale because you need to mull over things and come up with new ideas and be creative. So, uh, yeah, I think one thing that's really exciting is how do we have both of those happen together uh, without having them be independent? So, have have the the basic science work in step with the industry research uh, so that they can both feed off of each other most productively. Can can I say something quickly? Uh, just, just following on that because I think it's a very important point actually as well to recognize that sometimes it's presented like climate science is just going to be using kind of machine learning and computational tools to improve, but there is a lot of kind of knowledge that needs to go the other way. So. Climate science is, is the perfect kind of lab if you want to really achieve physics inspires. Uh, AI is, is one of the few places where you have a continuous feedback loop with kind of the real world that you can validate what you are doing, that we have kind of knowledge of the underpinning physical laws. So it's a perfect space actually to be able to improve AI itself. And, and that's what makes it even more dramatic, this point that is being raised by Ryan and, and Karhik from the point of view of so fundamental science and basic science has to happen. And we really need to figure out a way of really providing all, the, all of this infrastructure. So 20 years ago, 10 years ago, you could get away with just having essentially a kind of a, a, a little bit of a powerful kind of server there in your department, and you could do a lot of this research. That's no longer the case. The, the amount of infrastructure and the knowledge that you need to maintain to enable the ability to do research is quite huge. And, and yeah, the incentives currently are not there in academia. And, and even in kind of national labs, it's, it's, a, it's a struggle to do some of these things. So we have to find a new model and it has to be something that we do, we do in collaboration because it's going to be beneficial for everybody. Yeah, so I wanna follow up with a question, but first uh, one of the audience members, Jose Luis also contributed their own perspective, mentioning that uh, after working both in universities and national labs, their perspective is that universities, of course, not being market bound is, is, of course, a huge constraint and that, of course, they're important for good research in general. And they sort of weigh in that, in their opinion, good research groups and universities are much more advanced in terms of forecasting. So anyway, whether or not anybody believes that, just wanted to sort of share that audience perspective. But the question I actually wanted to follow up with is, I think implicitly in, in, in your three answers, um, you identified some similar issues in the sense that certain kinds of infrastructure incentives are, for example, missing in academia, but I think implicitly implied different um, solutions to this. So Ryan really focused on how do you actually build incentives within academia to enable cross-functional teams, incentivize the, the solving of hard engineering problems, incentivize the building of that infrastructure within academia. And I think Alberto and Karthik a little more emphasized the given that academia doesn't have these things now, how do you build collaborations with external entities to academia that, that do? And so I, I wanted to identify that and actually maybe also lean into that to say with that identified, do, do any of you have follow-up thoughts on, on, on sort of those two models and, and their relative kind of advantages and drawbacks? You really want us to disagree with each other. Huh? You're looking to get uh, some controversy going. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, 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 that's a fair way to characterize what I said. You know, um, I, I think, yeah, the idea that we're simply going to outsource our infrastructure and all our engineering to to Google or something, or you know, uh, is is, um, I, I, I don't think that's the way it's going to go. Um, I think certain aspects of that infrastructure can be outsourced. Um, 
what I hope happens. So the, the flip side of this is that the job market is also really opening up for our, our graduates, right? Our people who are coming out of academia now have all kinds of job opportunities that they didn't have uh, 10 years ago. Um, and and that's, that's good. And that, I think, is somewhat changing the incentives already in the sense that if you're looking for a traditional tenure track, you know, career, really your only metric is, is your publications. If you're looking to go get hired, say, on, you know, Alberto's team, like, well, they're probably going to be looking at your GitHub profile and, you know, other artifacts that you've created to demonstrate uh, your capabilities. So already I see some positive trends that people are focusing on what they can build, not necessarily just what, what how, you know, publication count. Um, so, yeah, I guess I'll leave it there with that, that optimistic view, but I'm curious to hear from Kartik and Alberto. Yeah, like, other, I guess, other than the people who are on your logos, you know, how, like those logos that are on your side, the formal collaborators, how is your work going to empower, say, people at a random, you know, university who are, don't, may, may not have that network and those connections to do this type of research? Yeah, great leading question. Uh, yeah, if I could jump in very quickly on, on two things. One is, uh, I really think we should be open sourcing all of our work, ideally, and if not most of our work, uh, and definitely all of the models. Uh, and that's that's what we're also pushing for with Earth2 is sort of thinking of it as maybe a three stack approach with the hardware at the bottom, a lot of the heavy engineering in the middle, and then you know all of the machine learning models and data that gets produced from all of that on the top. Uh, at the minimum, the top layer needs to be fully open so people can you know, use these models, use the data that comes out of these models, retrain the models in different ways, change architectures, et cetera. And we're trying to do that with ForecastNet and, and we will, well, actually we've done it with ForecastNet and we will be doing it with uh, all the other machine learning models that we develop. Uh, the second is sort of more on the people side, which is, uh, I'm really excited that uh, Professor Mike Pritchard from UC Irvine has joined joined us as a climate research director, uh, and Anima Anand Kumar, who's a professor at Caltech, has been at NVIDIA for several years now. And I think having this sort of uh, combination of people that have one foot in academia, one foot in the industry, and you know wear many hats is a really great way to, to collaborate with academia and to really have a much deeper integration of, of research with academic research, with industry research and, and heavy engineering. So uh, hopefully we'll see a lot more of that happening. I know it's maybe not the best thing that universities wanna hear is that their professors are spending time at the industry, but it, it, I mean, it works in computer science, it works in machine learning, it works in engineering, why not in climate science? I, I I agree with that. I I, I really see that we're going to see a trend. Like asking for a quick reply. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Time. Yeah. So I actually I wanted to ask one last question before we move to the to the Q and A session because we only have ten minutes left. So um, I mean Ryan, you um, voiced some concern or that the incentives might not be right in to achieve some like what we want to achieve in academia, but. Like what I'm wondering, like what are the incentives for big tech to push into um, this space now? Like, is there like a business interest to provide the best subseasonal forecasts? Maybe in ten years that will be like a very valuable asset. Or what is actually the the core motivation of Nvidia or Microsoft to really move for, like into this field now? I'm happy to start, and and I'm really keen to to hear the views from Karhik as well. I think it boils down to two points. So in, in, in the one point is infrastructure. So we, we provide infrastructure at a, at a very basic level and, and climate research consumes infrastructure. So that's, that's one angle and one way of, of looking at it. But then I think that there is a, an angle that is even more interesting, which is through the lens of sustainability, which is that now pretty much every company, every, every country is trying to move towards the, the path of net zero. And that essentially means that you need weather forecasts, you need climate predictions, you need to be able to use this as part of your, your kind of uh, emission reduction strategies, as part of kind of the, the removal of, of carbon emissions. And that open kind of a, a series of applications of climate science that perhaps were not kind of there a few a few years back. And I think that makes it very, very interesting. But 
again, it means that you need the, the right tools. It needs to be integrated with a series of services and, and with a series of, of kind of knowledge capabilities to make kind of a, a success of the whole thing. Yeah, I think Alberto already answered the question, but I'll, I'll maybe add one more point besides the, the huge need for the infrastructure, which of course these large tech industry companies are, are creating uh, and optimizing and accelerating and, and, and the need to move towards uh, sustainability and net zero, which of course means that you need to have better predictions and better forecasts and better applications that build on those predictions and forecasts. Uh, I think the third is also our, our CEO is is really deeply interested in in this in this grand challenge, and he really wants to invest in addressing climate change the best way possible. Uh, so there's there's also sort of a, an AI for social good uh, motivation here, uh, which which I think is also really important, and presumably many others on the planet as well. Absolutely. So thanks for sharing those perspectives. So. We have a ton of questions coming in from the audience, which we'll hope to get to a subset of. And um, also to the speakers, we're in a, of course, multimodal world. So also if there are questions that, that pique your interest that it doesn't seem like we'll get to in the synchronous discussion, feel free to also weigh in in the, in the Zoom chat. Um, but to ask one of the first ones um, uh, on a separate gear, kind of what new data sets are you looking forward to that are coming online now or in the next few years? So things like new satellites or IoT sensors or so forth. Um, and how will these new data sets maybe um, impact your, your research impact and your scope? Well, it's worth mentioning that our, our satellite is launching today. The NASA SWAT mission is literally launching today. So that's a great one. This is the NASA surface water and ocean topography satellite. I'm on the science team for it. So it just has to be mentioned. It's a new um, uh, instrument. Uh, it's a new mission that's going to measure surface water, both in rivers and uh, the ocean sea surface height. And so it has, it's going to have really powerful monitoring, like uh, hydrology monitoring capabilities for understanding stream flow and river flow uh, on land. And it's going to help us understand ocean eddies and ocean circulation, sea level rise better um, by providing higher resolution uh, altimetry of the ocean surface. And um, it's it's literally going up in the sky today. So that's that's pretty cool. <laughs> so another another one that I would highlight and, and it's related to some of the issues that we were kind of talking about with, with achieving net zero and so on is, is the new kind of sensors or capabilities that are appearing now in terms of uh, monitoring uh, CO2 emissions and, and kind of the, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. And we have missions like in Europe, CO2M with kind of ESA, new MEDSAT and so on. And I think they're going to be great actually to change the ability of, again, mixing the climate data with additional observations to drive action. Yeah, and if I could uh, complement what's been shared, I'm really excited about the uh, kilometer scale and sub-kilometer scale models uh, and and predictions that are coming out. I mean, it's it's really amazing to see some of these, you know, like icon kilometer scale, sub-kilometer scale results, and you can just see the the level of fidelity uh, in these data sets is so rich. So, yeah, that's that's super exciting. We had a few questions regarding like transitioning from research to um, maybe industry or being a researcher and working part-time or being on a sabbatical at Microsoft and NVIDIA, or maybe also finding an engineering job like that is working on climate science topics. Like, could you maybe give some advice to people in the audience how to, how to get started? I think a, a good place to start is through the internships. So there are, and I, it happens in Microsoft, but it happens in other companies and NVIDIA has them as well, kind of internships for people to, to come and if you want to test the waters and, and actually check and, and start developing relationships. And, and then, I, I mean, it's not that there is kind of a, a single path. It happens in many different ways. In some cases, it's kind of project-based because there is a particular kind of project that gets funded or, or initiative like the Climate Research Initiative that I was mentioning. And, and that kind of creates kind of links between people and groups that can lead into, into other paths. But, but yeah, it would essentially just encourage people to, to look at the, the job vacancies because more job vacancies are appearing and, and also opportunities like project calls, uh, internships, et cetera, and, and create those kind of relationships. 
Yeah, I'll also make a plug for um, the Climate Change AI newsletter, which which has uh, job postings and as well as the, the community platform, which have job postings from across um, academia, industry, all of these places. And so it can be one way to sort of get started and, and just get a sense of what, what options are available. Yeah, maybe, maybe two more quick things. Um, I think it's really cool that in the last three to four years, projects like Leap, m lines Klima, AI2, et cetera, have come on board that really bring um, academics with industry partners at a, at a very core deep level. And, and those sorts of collaborations, I think, can allow you know, more free movement of people both ways, uh, which is really exciting. That, and I'm seeing also in the chat uh, a, a nice idea, which I think already exists at NVIDIA, uh, maybe not all over the globe, but definitely in, in Asia Pacific, which is industry-funded PhDs. So uh, there's the NVIDIA AI Technology Center, which I think is headquartered in Hong Kong, uh, which, or maybe in Singapore, and they, and they fund PhDs at the National University of Singapore and elsewhere uh, where you spend half your time in the university, half your time in the industry. And I'd love to be able to see that, you know, mushroom all over the globe. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Um, all right, so last audience question before uh, we ask for closing re remarks and wrap, but um, the audience question we'll get to is, um, in addition to sharing data, and infrastructure and other things we talked about, how do we formulate questions in a more egalitarian way? So when we're talking about these conversations between academia and industry, could we somehow leverage these opportunities to make the formulation of research questions and the associated data more accessible to people kind of outside of either circle, including people on the front lines of climate change? This is actually a major focus of the LEAP uh, project. It's part of the project strategy, really places this um, bi-directional knowledge transfer at the center of the outreach strategy. And that involves bringing in community groups, um, climate justice activist groups, um, you know, uh, people in underserved communities, uh, and and also people from you know the the corporate world who you know are representing the business you know interests and and trying to get that two way conversation going by not just by saying okay here's here's the what climate projections say but really trying to understand what do people need to know um, in order to plan and can we target our research to try and optimize for those things rather than just sticking with the traditional metrics that we have um, always uh, always emphasized. You know, global, global mean temperature, for example, is probably the least useful <laughs> metric uh, for anyone, right? Just to, to take an extreme case. So, you know, those discussions are happening. Um, and it, it's, it's hard work and requires a lot of outreach, um, but I think uh, we have a good framework to, to be doing that within LEAP. Yeah, I'm going to jump in and, and yeah, it's a great question because it sort of brings me back to the very start, which is the sort of driving mission for us is interactivity. And uh, if you haven't seen uh, Bjorn Stevens's Supercomputing 2020 keynote, he really lays this out beautifully where it's, it's not so much about giving someone a better bit of data and saying, go do what you want with it, but building systems that non-experts can ask these what if questions and receive responses that are trustworthy in a reasonable amount of time, so fairly low latency. Uh, and that, that is the core mission of Earth2. Uh, so I, I think building the, the platforms and the interfaces that allow people to ask these questions in simple ways, and then having the translation to what that means as a scientific question, probing the data, getting the responses, and then giving it back in a visually easy to understand fashion. Uh, is is really critical because just pointing someone to a petabyte scale data set somewhere on a supercomputer is not helpful. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. It's a, it's a extremely relevant question. And it is something that we have been looking for, example, in things like the, the Climate Research Initiative is one of the criteria. But I, 
I would also praise kind of the, the work that is having happening in, in climate change AI by creating these kind of opportunities. Because again, just the, the fact that we are having this conversation and, and we are having this event is, is a great way of actually just opening the conversation. But yeah, more, more has to happen and, and the more kind of vehicles and avenues that we set up to make this happen, the better. Okay. Thanks uh, for all the audience questions. Um, we unfortunately couldn't answer all of them. There's still a few left, but I think every, I hope everyone uh, learned something today. I would like to close it today to give uh, each of you the opportunity to maybe have 30 seconds briefly, some closing remarks of what you um, yeah, think is important, maybe for the future. Uh, maybe we start with Ryan. Sure. Yeah. I mean, like I like I like to sort of identify what I see as problem areas, but I'd like to close by saying that, like, this is an absolutely fantastic problem to be working on. It's just so cool from, you know, the just the visual beauty of climate data, especially at high resolution, the intellectual challenge of modeling what, you know, turbulence and clouds and all of these extremely complex physical systems. And then the, the opportunity to use state of the art, you know, uh, AI methods. Um, it's just such a great research problem. It's really, I feel like, what humanity should be doing with our, our, our you know, limited brain power right now. Um, and so I encourage anyone, particularly if you're on the, the AI side um, and looking for an application in climate science, to get involved in the actual climate modeling problem, because it is an extremely rich one that needs uh, all, all hands on deck. Yeah, maybe two quick closing remarks from my side are, uh, well, first of all, I'm, I'm very grateful for uh, the seminar and for bringing us together. I think CCAI is doing some amazing work and yeah, I'd love to participate more actively and, and see more of these things happening. Uh, and then the second is maybe a charge to all of us in the climate community is to create benchmark problems, benchmark data sets that kind of opens up these questions in a more accessible way to a much broader community. Because one thing that I often hear from machine learning people is that this is such a complex field. I have no idea what, what I need to optimize for or what I need to build. And so trying to bring some of those grand challenges out into somewhat distilled benchmark data sets and problems would be super helpful to, to get more people to look at it. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that Ryan and, and Karhit has, has hit the nail in the head. I, I think, first of all, this is a super exciting area and this is a great time to be involved in this in this space because for the first time, I mean, it's really changing. It, the climate modeling is really being open now to be done in, in different ways to, to the way that has happened in the past 50 years. And second, just reiterate what Karhit was saying that we really need to bring together kind of the challenges and the data sets and, and the tools and really open the field so people can tackle these things. And in many ways, we need to do what has happened with other problems like ImageNet and, and so on, because otherwise it's very difficult. So this is a complex space. It's, the data is big, the data is complex, but this is, is essentially the problem that we need to solve as humanity. Otherwise, we are really going to have quite a lot of issues in, in the near future, and, and we have a lot of issues today. So it's definitely an area where it's, it's worth investing time, effort, and talent. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. I think we had a great discussion today. There was some controversy, but we also see that there's a lot of room for collaboration. And I think you all gave a great pledge to start working in the climate science and AI field. Um, so yeah, thanks again to all the speakers and also for everyone being here. Have a great day, afternoon or evening and yeah, see you in the next year. Bye.